And we are live. Uh, welcome to everybody who's joining us. Uh, we're just going to let the, uh, the attendance populate. A lot of people here today, uh, which is very cool. Uh, welcome to you all. I am Ben Wittes. I am here in the virtual jungle studio, the special Austin, Texas hotel room version where I am up against the circuit board tapestry, which, you know, if you press the right button will give me a little bit of a jolt. Roger Parloff is joining us from the Scott studio. Anna Bauer is insisting that this is not a background picture, but is actually where she is. Anna, what is the name of this uh, garden looking thing of your uh, palatial mansion? This is the Anna of Green Gables garden. <laughs> the Anna of Green Gables garden and Josh Gerstein of Politico, uh, old buddy, a true court rat and uh, uh, one of the, uh, uh, one of my uh, favorite uh, bylines, uh, welcome to Lawfare Live. What is the name of the room you're joining us from? Um, how, why don't we call it the doghouse? How's that? The doghouse. Excellent. And joining us uh, uh, with a cool surprise is Heyman Han, Lawfare uh, Associate Editor. Uh, what? Where are you joining us from, Heyman? I am in my apartments library my roommates and i have a nice little library that we like to share so this is the library the library room excellent all right so we're going to start we got a lot of ground to cover today um uh, and i want to just make start with a disclosure here i am like way behind because i've been on the road for the last uh week and a half and uh i haven't really kept up with the news. So when I ask uh, our contributors uh, questions today, it's gonna be like brief me as well as brief you. And as a result of that, if anybody thinks I'm asking the wrong question, you guys, just say, Wittis, that's a dumb question. What you should have asked me was X and ask the question, ask yourself the question that I should have asked because I am like super behind right now. All right, we're gonna start with Heyman Han. Uh, as we have been uh, demonstrating uh, for you guys new features as we're rolling them out on the website uh, related to uh, Trump trials material, uh, Heyman and uh, some of her colleagues have developed a, uh, a new addition to this, which is tracking uh, 14th Amendment Section 3 litigation. I want to say this is a first in the entire history of the 14th Amendment, there has never before been a tracker of litigation under the 14th Amendment Section 3. So you saw it here first. Heyman, uh, give us a little walkthrough. Wow, thank you so much for that introduction, Ben. So I'm gonna share this oh, screen. It's a moment in constitutional history, folks. It's no, the you're... first ever 14th Amendment Section 3 tracker. To our knowledge, yes, we don't, we haven't seen one anywhere else. So there was that one in like 1871, <laughs> but it was in Back a stone in the tablet. Had to track things manually, probably. Yeah. No, no websites to show, but yes. Um, and a shout out to Caleb Benjamin, who worked on this project with me. Um, I'm just going to show folks how to get to it from our homepage. So if you just go to lawfaremedia.org, this is the homepage. And if you want to get to the tracker, you can click on current projects under which you'll find, as Ben mentioned, a number of running projects we have, including the Jan 6 project and the Trump trials page. The tracker is nestled right there. And this will bring you to the map and the section three litigation table. So the map in the table are showing obviously the same things, but just in different formats. You can click on the state that you might be interested in looking at. For instance, uh, Minnesota has an interesting case. You can you have to first click on the state and then it'll freeze it. And then you can click on the um, table version that will automatically populate. And then if you want to go back to 
the, the map, you can just press the back button and it'll bring you there. Or if you wanted to just do it by the table, you can scroll down. Um, it also scrolls horizontally, which um, we couldn't figure out a way to show you that there's a little horizontal bar, but we promise it exists. So if you just want to move your mouse that way, it'll also show you the initial complaint, any relevant motions to dismiss. Um, and then if the state has um, its own docket, we have tried to link it there for you so that you can see every single one of the filings to your heart's desire. And we also have a section here for the cases that we in Lawfare are watching. For instance, Roger has been live tweeting the Colorado trial that started on Monday. So definitely look out for that. But there's also, again, dockets here for the cases that we're particularly interested in following. And I think that's about it. Um, uh, of course, oh, at the end, we also have selected reading on section three analysis that might be helpful for context. And we'll continue to tag any more analysis we have down here so that it populates. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Heyman. Um, and I guess we should, uh, we're going to come back to um, uh, section three, because we have a lot of section three news this week. Uh, but before we do, Josh, uh, you were in Florida yesterday um, uh, in Fort Pierce for the hearing uh, before Judge Eileen Cannon. And our, our viewers have a particular interest in uh, uh, all things Judge Eileen Cannon. We're going to get to that. But first of all, Tell us a little bit about what the hearing was about and what happened yesterday. Well, Ben, I mean, uh, I'll say first, this was my first visit to Fort Pierce or the Fort Pierce uh, courthouse. Um, so it was interesting to see what could be the location for a major Trump trial if it if it ever happens. So we can talk a little bit about the Atmo, I guess, afterwards. Were, were you as unimpressed with it as a courthouse for a presidential trial as Anna has been? Basically, yeah. I mean, I think the, from a public access point of view, they're going to have major issues. Uh, they seem to think it was sort of generous access, but to have sort of two row, a two row gallery for a trial uh, of the pre uh, of a former president of the United States and perhaps future president of the United States is sort of uh, seemed a little ridiculous. And it didn't seem like whoever designed it uh, had much interest in providing public uh, access. M maybe the whole thing was designed mostly as a, you know, a kind of a, uh, either either graft or, or pork a pork barrel project, because um, it, it seemed like the views and other things were taken into account. Uh, the top floor has a nice view of the of the water and so forth. Uh, but how how many humans could actually sit in a courtroom other than the participants didn't seem to have been a major factor in the planning. So so yeah, the bottom line is yes, I'm not too impressed with it. But but I do think probably it is the case from a security point of view. It's probably I can understand why if you were mostly looking at the security issues, it might be considered actually an optimal venue because it's possible they don't have to do anything else there for a couple of months. So um, they could handle most thing, most everything else somewhere else. So you can't say that about Miami, Fort Lauderdale or or um, the main courthouse there in West West Palm, which is also not one of my favorite courthouses in America. So th there's my take on the on the place. It's also a two two courtroom set. It's only a two courtroom courthouse. Um, so you know, there's just there's not a lot of extra um, extra space to to play to to play play around with there. So it'll be interesting to see how they're going to attempt to pull this off in the absence of, of you know, audio or video outside the court, which at the moment seems to me be very unlikely to happen. So um, so that's sort of the atmo. Do you want me to go into what actually? Um, yes. Yeah, so what was before Judge Cannon uh, yesterday? So basically it was scheduling. I mean, just the setup is that this is actually the first hearing she's had sort of on the general issues of the case and the status of the case in public um, in three, more than three months. So 
Um, and the first hearing she had three months ago was the first hearing before her in this case. So there hasn't been a lot of, um, there were a couple hearings about lawyer conflict issues, but, but in sort of like, where do we stand with this case? And can we get to trial uh, as she has set uh, by the end of May, May 20th, I think? Um, can we do that? Uh, that issue had been playing out a bit in the papers, but had not actually had a live hearing. And that's what this hearing was basically uh, about the defense for all three defendants. People should remember it's not just Trump. There's um, Walt Nauta, who is Trump's uh, personal aide and served in that capacity in the White House and then somehow in the private sector as well. And then the, the second or the third defendant, second co-defendant is Carlos de Oliveira, who is some combination of sort of a property manager and perhaps had some security duties um, related to uh, Mar-a-Lago. So all three of them are basically saying that the current schedule for this trial is unrealistic. There's no way it can go forward um, in May. And not only that, that the current deadlines that are in place for all types of motions sort of all need to be extended due to various problems that have arisen over the past uh, few months. Uh, the, you know, the main, there are different kinds of problems, but most of the problems that I detect had to do around um, classified information. Obviously, the case is about Trump allegedly retaining uh, a, a large trove of classified information at Mar-a-Lago after he wasn't president anymore. And despite the fact he was repeatedly asked to give it back and also several different claims that he obstructed uh, justice, obstructed the investigation and tried to get videotapes erased that are material to who might have had access to those um those documents so the classified documents are are the crux of the case and you know the obviously the defense for all three defendants wants to see them uh and so uh, th that's been one of the main issues uh, ironically i guess is the word you could say is that you know some of this stuff is allegedly so highly classified that even a normal skiff um which is the type of i think it's sensitive compartmented information facility um, the normal place that you look at classified, there's different levels. And for some of this information, there's apparently no facility in, at least in South Florida, maybe in the whole state of Florida, that's actually fully authorized to look at some of these documents or to handle these documents and discuss them. Um, they're in the process of trying to address that issue. I think there's a temporary workaround where a courier is going to fly documents from Washington all the way. Uh, or the Washington area all the way down to Florida every time the defense wants to look at them. Um, you know, the prosecutors say it's only a small amount of the material um, and the most of it is more generically classified or can be handled in a more normal uh, normal way. So this hearing was basically about that, the, the different side saying like, here, here's the logistical problems we've encountered. Uh, Canon has already paused some of the deadlines related to the classified information uh, Procedures Act filings in this case, but it sort of became clear that the deadlines are going to need to be further adjusted. She used this phrase, make reasonable adjustments. Um, and, you know, it, it was interesting to hear, you know, the government basically said it, these are minor hiccups and, uh, you know, there's no need to derail the case. The most interesting discussion, I think, was sort of about the interaction between that case and the one that is set to go on uh, to trial in March in Washington before Judge Tanya Chutkin and Jay Bratt, who is uh, sort of leading this prosecution down there in Florida, who's a veteran national security prosecutor at the Justice Department, but is assigned to the special counsel's office at this point. Um, he basically told uh, Judge Cannon down there that she should ignore the fact that Trump is scheduled for another trial in March, um, happens to involve some of the same uh, defense lawyers. And and just sort of proceed apace because she said, we don't know if that trial is actually going to happen on the schedule that it's on. And it's crazy to try to predict what's going to happen. Um, and Judge Cannon seemed to think that that was a strange way to proceed. I felt a little bit at the hearing, like, you know, the, the claim was like, well, sure, these two trains might be speeding towards each other, but let's just wait a while and, you know, see, maybe the other guy's going to turn for his headlights will move over first and and then I don't have to worry about it. Um, which to me seems a little bit weird. Um, and then, of course, the other 
elephant in the room there that was, I heard the word election mentioned only once by Mr. Bratt, and I don't think anybody else mentioned it, but all these deadlines, these the trials that are scheduled are like right in the heart of the primary season. I know Trump thinks he's already wrapped up the nomination basically, but technically people do still get to vote primaries and caucuses if they want to. And so to have a trial in early March, even May, there's still some primaries and uh, taking place at that point. And it's never really been clear from sort of either side, you know, the, the prosecutors seem very reluctant to talk about this. Um, they they made some weird, um, overly euphemistic reference in some earlier filing to Trump's professional obligations or something like that. I'm not sure if politics is a profession, but that's what they referred to it as. Um, and the defense, you know, brings it up occasionally, but I think they know that Judge Cannon is unlikely to say that she's going to delay the trial because of for what someone might call political reasons. So th this was all the wrestling match that took place um, yesterday. And um, at the end of the day, it seemed like she was, le le she obviously has to change some of the deadlines and it seemed like she was probably um, going to delay the trial from late May, but whether that meant sh she would take up the Trump side's proposal that it roll over to the middle of, uh, middle of November, she just, she, she didn't say, and it's just not clear Where's the stopping point? Because as bad as it is to have a trial during the primary season, imagine trying to have a trial in the middle of the general election. Right, know. it's kind of out of the frying pan into the so, fire there. Right, so there, there's, there are no great dates to set a trial between um, May and November. Doesn't mean you couldn't do it, but but there's, there's no obvious quiet time or whatever. Uh, and so we're now awaiting Judge uh, Cannon putting out some kind of order about uh, what she plans to do here. And obviously, if she pushes it till after the election, um, you know, uh, there will be many people who will regard this as part of, you know, a, a pattern on her part of being overly deferential to Trump that stretches all the way back to before this case being indicted when she happened to be assigned the issue of the special master that Trump asked for to go through all the documents. Um, you know, I, I thought she was... Um, you know, she was definitely more aggressive in her attitude towards the prosecution than to the defense. But I thought on balance, some of the things the prosecution was saying were a little more out there. The defense lawyers took a pretty conciliatory approach and said, um, you know, uh, oh, yeah, we've gotten now we've gotten the information we're supposed to have, but we only just got it a couple days ago, but we do have it. It's just a matter of sorting out how we can see it. And we're having a lot of logistical issues around um, the skiffs and, and the classified. So it didn't seem like the kind of thing where she was going to come down on them like a ton of bricks anyway. Um, so so that that's sort of what I detected in the room. But she was very businesslike and um, a little bit stern. Uh, there weren't a lot of jokes or, you know, um, chit, -ch chit chat um, in the courtroom yesterday. <laughs> So meanwhile, she has ruled on a significant SEPA question. Um, uh, Roger, I know you've looked at that uh, uh, ruling. Uh, Josh, have you? Yeah, I did. It came out just before. Um, I mean, Roger can talk about it. It came out just before the, the hearing. Um, and as I understand it, the prosecution, it, I, most of it boils down to the two co-defendants that I mentioned and sort of will they get sort of as robust access to the classified information as Trump and his lawyers are going to get? And the government seems to want the right to shield those defendants from some of the classified information. Um, you know, they are individuals that would not have probably would not have had any legitimate way to ever access this information. Trump, on the other hand, obviously, while he was president, could have accessed any classified information and at least in my opinion declassified any information if that was his desire and he actually did it so so they don't seem to be putting up as much of a fight the prosecutors as about the the other co-defendants and there was an issue that is pretty technical about whether they can just the judge can just issue a protective order and and that could keep information from you know those co-defendants or whether the, the, the government has to follow the SEPA procedures in order to wall this information off from those defendants. And the judge basically sided with the defendants and said, 
um, you need to go through the SEPA procedure. It doesn't mean that any particular information uh, will be ultimately treated differently, but it sets up a process and the consensus down there in Florida among reporters was that this would probably add a bit more delay, although the the defense has an argument that it's more straightforward to deal with the SEPA issues closer to trial. So it's hard to say what it'll do. It's not going to certainly not going to accelerate the case and it might it might need to lead to more delays. I, I don't know what Roger's take on it, but that 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 was my assessment. Roger, do you have thoughts on the the SEPA order? Just a little. It it um, it's uh, puts the government in a difficult spot because they haven't really lost anything yet. So it's like they they can't they aren't going to appeal it because they can still keep these out of view of the defendants by going through this other procedure. It is dif different from like all the precedents, and it's a problem in other cases. Um, it has to do with the word either defense or defendant, which has been interpreted by lots of other courts to mean you turn these classified documents over to the defendant's lawyer who has a clearance, but not to the defendant. And uh, that's what they're doing. That's what they wanted to do with de Oliveira and, uh, and Nauta. And... Uh, uh, um, and the judge is saying, no, it does, uh, uh, section three of SEPA is what we're talking about at the moment, doesn't allow that. If it says defend, defense or defendant, you need to give it to the defendant unless you go through this section four procedure. And the problem is there are a lot of cases where you're prosecuting a terrorist and you have classified information you're using and you don't want to turn over that information to the terrorists and you're willing to give it to the lawyer. So anyway, uh, there's a lot of law outside the 11th circuit on this, but not in the 11th circuit. Now there is law against the government on this question, but like I say, it doesn't matter yet. So they probably won't appeal. Um, and just a reminder to everybody who are not SEPA practitioners in the audience, uh, almost all judgments before a final judgment is entered in a criminal case are not subject to immediate or interlocutory appeal. Judgments under the Classified Information Procedures Act, however, are. So uh, there's this dance going on between Judge Cannon and the government in which, uh, you know, the government is I, I don't think I'm psychoanalyzing here, itching to take her up to the 11th Circuit again. Uh, and uh, uh, and SEPA is going to be the vehicle by which at some point in this process that is likely to happen. Um, all right. So um, Anna Bauer. Um, actually, let's 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 do Section 3 before Fulton County. Um, uh Roger, we have had Section 3 of the 14th Amendment in addition to the that it now has its own tracker, which, you know, very few provisions of the of, of do, but it now has its own tracker on lawfare. Uh, it's also had a big week for other reasons, uh, unlike any other provision of, of the 14th Amendment. It has two big cases going on this week, one in Minnesota and one in Colorado. So first of all, tell us there are different procedures being used in these two states. Um, what are the procedural mechanisms that these challenges are happening under? Yeah, uh, well, to, to give you the overview and, and thanks to the tracker, I can and do this. We, we've, we found there are 30 cases that have been filed, but that challenge uh, putting Trump on the ballot. Um, but 23 of them were filed by a single individual who is not a lawyer and who has filed um, pro se for him. And uh, his his record is not very good so far. He's uh, So if you put the side, 
there are fewer serious cases going on. And two, two of the most serious are the ones that actually went to trial uh, this week. Um, and the one in, they both involve a statute statutes that are, are, are pretty similar. They're, they have expedited, the state has expedited uh, rules that al allow challenges to the eligibility of a candidate. And um, they, uh, and they allow if, if there's a, if you think the Secretary of State has made or is about to make a mistake about eligibility, you can challenge that and any voter can do that. It might not be exactly that language. In these cases, it's mainly Republican voters that ha are filing, although it's it's also, you know, sort of public interest groups that are really uh, providing the lawyers and so on. So um, th uh, the mechanisms are different in the two states. In Colorado, you file it in the state district court. And in Minnesota, you file it directly in the state Supreme Court, which is really important because if if you get a ruling uh, certainly if you get a ruling adverse to Trump it, it will go immediately to the US Supreme Court um so this the state tr uh, court trial it's a five days have been allotted all week has been allotted to this trial uh, before judge Sarah B Wallace and um uh, that's been underway. And then this morning, the, the Minnesota case had an oral argument. So it's all on the papers other than, than that there won't be a trial with evidence in Minnesota, but there was oral argument this morning. And, and I was able to see about two thirds of that before I had to, uh, to get, you know, to come here. Um, but uh, the, the, um, case in uh, Colorado uh, is being prosecuted by, in essence, by the crew group, the Citizens for Responsible Responsibility and Ethics in Washington. Um, and uh, they, they uh, were the ones who successfully, you might remember, ousted um, the county commissioner, Coy Griffin, in New Mexico. Um, as a section three, uh, as an insurrectionist, um, perhaps I should take a step back and remind people what section three is. It, it, it is this post-Civil War um, uh, clause that uh, very, very oversimplifying uh, disqualifies insurrectionists from certain offices. And, um, and so that went to trial. Um, before it went to trial, something interesting happened on Monday. The crew had been planning to call two uh, members, uh, two of the Trump White House uh, as witnesses. One was billed as a member of Trump's inner circle. Um, uh, over the weekend, both of those witnesses, they, they weren't named because of a protection order. Uh, over the weekend, uh, they both bailed. And um, they uh, got cold feet for one reason or another, and they withdrew. Um, so that was a blow. Um, then they called uh, Danny Hodges. They called two police officers, including Danny Hodges, who you've all seen. He's the Metropolitan Police Department officer that was caught in the uh, uh, doorway in the Lower West Terrace uh, 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 archway, tunnel archway, some of the most violent uh, fighting on January 6th. Uh, another officer, um, Dr. Peter Simi, who's an expert from Chap Chapman University about uh, political extremism and political violence, uh, talking about the way Trump talks to right wing groups about, you know, sort of dog whistles, about doublespeak, about the way he, he he'll say something and then he'll negate it. Uh, for plausible deniability, um, uh, I, I can't convey to you the the contempt with which uh, uh, the Trump lawyer pronounced the word sociologist or sociology <laughs> uh, each time that came up. Um, the next was a, a professor, Bill, Bill Banks, who was an expert on national security, uh, who uh, from uh, emeritus at Syracuse. He talked about um 
Well, uh, it, it, he talked about the fact that uh, the president is the commander uh, of the D.C. National Guard and, you know, he could have done more and uh, uh, also the other uh, steps he could have taken uh, during the hours between 1.21 p.m. when he became aware of the riot and 4.17 when he called off his um, his followers. Uh, and then Gerard Malioka was the main uh, live uh, constitutional law professor. In fact, he'll be the only constitutional law professor to actually testify, although I think there are a lot of references to the key treatises here. And Malioka spoke about the meaning of insurrection and also the meaning of president, uh, um, I mean, the meaning of uh, 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 officer, officer, uh, the term used in the section three and whether it covers presidency. Um, Malioka is the professor who happened to write a treatise on this subject in December 2020, uh, just before January 6th, so he happens to have unusual credibility. Almost everything else written on the subject has been subsequent. And then there was somebody from the Secretary of State's office just to talk about the past practice of enforcing uh, eligibility principles. Then the defense case began yesterday with sort of a bang. Cash Patel was the first witness. Um, and uh, as you know, uh, Cash Patel in other circumstances has been sort of Trump's go-to uh, alibi guy. Uh, you know, he, in the classified documents case, we don't know if he'll appear in the real case, but he quickly appeared in the press and said he had been there in a meeting with the president and saw him, you know, uh, declassify everything. Um, well, here, uh, he has uh, uh, made a claim um, at various times that he was at a meeting with Trump. It might have been January 3rd, might have been January 4th, might have been January 5th, where Trump um, allegedly authorized the use of 10 to 20,000 National Guard troops. Um, but uh, if, uh, if uh, uh, Mayor Bowser needed them or the Capitol Police did, but... Um, but uh, they they refused. Uh, there's no documentation confirming that that occurred. Um, and that was another thing that the uh, petitioners uh, expert addressed. And then there was Kat Katrina Pearson. But ha had, hang on, did he testify to that uh, meeting having taken place in, in the trial? Uh, Patel did, yes. Yes, and on 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 cross, there was questions about um, um, uh, all the different statements he's made over time and why it isn't documented anywhere. And ten to twenty thousand, you know, DC has uh, eleven hundred tr troops. So to authorize calling up ten to twenty thousand means federalizing bringing in troops from other places. Um, it, it's all, uh, and then different rules apply, the posse comitatus laws apply. You aren't supposed to use those for law enforcement. And uh, all we have a record for is 340 National Guard troops that Bowser asked for, and that was approved. And we do have confirmation of that. And those guys wore yellow vests, they didn't wear guns, and they were in the subway system helping, you know, helping other people, helping, you know, the other police officers uh, with crowd control. But um, uh, then there was Katrina Pearson, then there was um, Amy Kramer uh, from Women for America First. As, as often happens, uh, uh, and Josh certainly has seen this in the, in the January 6th cases, when the defendant chooses to put on a case, it tends to help the, <laughs> the prosecution case. And uh, in some cases, I would say that that uh, happened here. Amy Kramer was called, I guess, to testify that um, when, you know, uh, it, people, the crowd, was, people were happy. It was happy, a joyful occasion. You could see it on their faces. Um, and when Trump mentioned uh, fighting like hell, uh, uh, or you won't have a country anymore. It was metaphorical. Um, 
on cross, uh, they brought her attention to some of her own tweets where she called uh, had called um, uh, the election of uh, November 2020 a coup and had suggested that Pence was in on the coup to remove Trump. And uh, she testified on cross. I don't think Pence was ever on the Trump team or on Team Trump. Uh, there was a tweet from her about victory or death. So there was some there was some tough cross examination of her. There was a Thomas Van Flyn called, who was the chief of staff of Congressman Gosar. He also testified. He was there for two hours. He said um, the atmosphere was festive. Uh, on cross, uh, he was confronted with. Um, uh, some films of people saying storm the Capitol, storm the Capitol as they listened to the speech. He said, well, they must have been listening to Ray Epps, um, the, uh, the, uh, the supposed, uh, uh, yeah, the supposed federal uh, 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 the false flag, uh, federal uh, uh, conspiracy theory. Um, and he was also confronted with a long line of texts between him and Ali Alexander on the morning of January 6th. He got angry when shown them. He said, uh, how did you get those? Um, he got, I mean, they were just part of the January 6th report. Ali Alexander had turned them over. He wouldn't confirm their authenticity. Um, uh, he, and in some, Alexander was telling him to get everybody in the Freedom Caucus over to the Ellipse. POTUS wants force these sorts of things. So he was not a very effective witness. Uh, Tom Bjorklund, um, a state Republican Party treasurer who um, went to the ellipse, he said he brought body armor because he was afraid of uh, Antifa. Uh, he, he did leave it in the car rather than bringing it because it was very heavy. Um, and then uh, the, the last witness was very interesting, but I had to interrupt. It was Representative Ken Buck, um, uh, the congressman, and he was uh, called with, for, with, for an important point to to argue that the January sixth report is not a uh, uh, to argue that it's not a uh, truly bipartisan. It's it's not an adversarial document. And that's very important because the government is. I mean, the government, the petitioners are relying very heavily on the January sixth report. And it, it is scary, the idea that you would rely on, you know, can you imagine like this oversight committee now in, uh, uh, you know, are you going to really rely on congressional reports in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, lawsuits like this? Um, and so he's testifying about the fact that he didn't regard it as adversarially uh, generated. Um, and then act actually the, the petitioners will call Tim Hafey tomorrow, the senior, I, I forget his title, but the sort of the lead counsel for the select committee to testify tomorrow to sort of counteract that. So that's where Colorado lies. Uh, and, is the, the, and, and is the, the trial supposed to wrap up tomorrow or, or yes, will it, or is there it more will, of it? Yeah, it should end tomorrow. All, and then um, there will be a break for briefing, and then she may hear oral argument. Um, but she wants to get it. She would like to get a decision done. Um, I can't remember. I think by Thanksgiving, she knows. She said, you know, I, I understand. It's My job is to get this to the Colorado Supreme Court. So, you know, she understands she's a, just an interim step. And, so is uh, the, and the appeal would go to the Colorado first at the Colorado Supreme Court and then presumably to the U.S. Supreme Court if if they were to strike Trump from the ballot. Right. I mean, yes. Uh, you know, I'm sure the petitioners would try to appeal as right, well. But the Supreme Court doesn't need to hear it. No. If, unless he's stricken. So what about Minnesota? Minnesota, the, the Supreme Court has original jurisdiction, right? Yeah. And um, I should mention, uh, although, uh, well, I, I don't know if I should or shouldn't, but um, the court is six to one. Um, I mean, these are nonpartisan. Uh, you don't run on a party 
ticket that you're appointed by the governor, but six of the seven were appointed by Democratic uh, governors. And um, in Minnesota, I should say the Colorado Supreme Court, I think is all, all I think all seven are Democratic uh, governors appointed, but I, I'm not sure about that. I shouldn't say that. But um, uh, two of them uh, recused, both Democrats. So we're down to four to one. Um, and then uh, it was a very lively argument. It was not, uh, you know, obviously, um, uh, it, it wasn't obvious. The, the chief justice who was appointed by a Democrat um, was very concerned about the chaos that this would call cause. Um, and uh, there were a lot of questions about Gr uh, Griffin's case. This is this old um, uh, controversial ruling by a chief justice, but not acting as a chief justice. You know, back then, uh, this was uh, uh, in the... I forget the year if it was around 1870 or so on, but um, uh, it, 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 the justices rode circuit. And so um, there was a case where he ruled that um, th this statute was not self, -ex uh, this uh, clause of the constitution was not self executing. Uh, a lot of uh, that's not binding on anyone, but he was technically. Uh, Chief Justice. He had rendered a ruling in this same sort of circuit capacity earlier uh, that was 180 degrees the opposite, um, which uh, is odd. And then um, uh, there, there are other uh, uh, str strange aspects of that ruling. And, and the 14th Amendment has five sections. Uh, the fifth is the enforcement section, but nobody suggests that any of the other sections are not self-executing. The, the others are crucial sections like, you know, the equal protection clause and so on. Nobody says that's, you know, that's not self-executing. So um, a, a lot of scholars are dubious of Griffin's case, but it's there and it's one of the few precedents there is, and it would also give them an out uh, if 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 they really don't want to uh, handle this very uh, volatile and potentially violent uh, uh, issue, I and, so, and I, I, I listened I, I, to at least two thirds. I heard um, I, I heard the petitioner's opening argument, the, Trump's response, the Secretary of State's response, the beginning of the Colorado response. There were very, there was, it wasn't until two thirds of the way through that anyone mentioned insurrection. It's all focused on, and only one judge brought that up. It's all focused on uh, justiciability. Um, uh, uh, is this a political question or is this uh, self executing and, and a few other fine points like that? All right. And do we have any sense of a time frame from the Minnesota Supreme Court? Uh, I don't, although, uh, I don't, uh, I, I, the, everybody needs the primary ballot has to be certified by January 5th. So everyone wants this to go through the process before January 5th, not just them, but the Supreme court. All right. So we expect action relatively quickly there. And as to your earlier point, it is clearly not an accident that the uh, plaintiffs have brought these cases uh, first in um, case in, in states that are, uh, uh, have a significantly democratically appointed uh, Supreme Court. They're trying to get one of these states to strike Trump from the ballot and then fight the thing at the Supreme Court, which if they were to win, which is of course an outside chance, would affect the entire country. So that's that's the strategy. Um, all right, Anna Bauer, uh, let's break some news. While we have been talking, Judge Tanya Chutkin, 
Uh, don't forget about Judge Tanya Chutkin. Uh, she's, uh, uh, you know, got the other case, the one we're not really focused on today. In the district, she has issued an order, and it concerns jury selection. And what does it say? It does. So this order from Judge Chutkin kind of sets out the a part of the jury selection procedure that will happen starting, and she gives us a date. February, Drum roll, please. February 9th, 2024, which is only three months from now, which is really crazy because, um, you know, it it seems like it was just yesterday that uh, that arraignment happened. Um, so and and Judge Chetkin has been very set on keeping this uh, March 4th trial date for the January 6th federal case. Uh, so she says that uh, this jury questionnaire, uh, which is kind of what this order is all about, um, is uh, going to be distributed to jurors on February 9th. Um, and jury questionnaires are, are uh, you know, forms that jurors, prospective jurors fill out when they come in, uh, when they're summoned to jury service, if anyone has not actually ever been summoned and, and gone to uh, uh, serve as a juror, you know, and you fill out um, things like your name and your uh, age. And uh, there are some questions on there that usually help the parties kind of streamline the jury selection process. Um, so they'll be able to, uh, you know, go ahead and as they go through those uh, questions, they can maybe get a sense of your beliefs and, 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 uh, de determine which people they might, um, you know, think uh, need to be struck for cause or, or something like that when voir dire starts um, and, and they actually start uh, having jurors be questioned. Um, so it's a it's a process that just kind of helps things go more efficiently. Um, this order also specifies that for jury research, the parties are allowed to use kind of open source information. So I, I'm assuming that that usually because usually that refers to things like social media, public social media profiles, um, uh, LinkedIn pages, like thing, anything that is already publicly available. Um, the parties are able to kind of uh, use that for juror research. Um, but she specifies that uh, you're, the parties are not supposed to distribute any kind of identifying information about jurors beyond the defense or government teams. Um, and, and interestingly, uh, she specifies, particularly when she's saying that, that she uh, does not want information about jurors distributed to the defendant's campaign. Uh, that's kind of the example that she puts in parentheses. Um, so I think that, you know, she is is making a very pointed um, instruction there to Trump's team uh, to, you know, not provide um, uh, not provide things. Oh, and also John Hawkins, John, Haw John says, oh, normally the parties use non-public databases for juror research. Right. OK, so you can't use um, like paid services, I'm assuming that that probably no, means like, no data brokers. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So that's interesting. But um, that's kind of the contours, uh, the basic contours of the order. Uh, and it is really exciting that uh, this case looks like it is uh, set for March. And I, of course, we don't know what could happen between now and then, but uh, it, it certainly looks like Judge Shutkin is is ready to have a trial in March. But I'm curious to hear what Josh thinks, or if he has any thoughts on the order or uh, or where that case is is going. Well, I mean, one thing is there's a stay motion pending right now um, that the case should just be stayed while she sorts out this issue of immunity. Um, it's pretty widely expected that. If she denies Trump's immunity motion, he's not going to just wait to see what happens, but he's going to try to take that immediately to the D.C. circuit. And then if he doesn't get relief there, take it to the Supreme Court on emergency on an emergency uh, basis. Um, so it, it, I kind of agree if she thought she's going to grant a stay, she probably wouldn't go to all the trouble of laying out all these procedures in a 
in a um, you know jury selection order. A couple other thoughts I have are um, it's interesting that she did not opt for a quote unquote anonymous jury. You may remember in the Car- Carroll case up in New York, the judge, I think Sua Sponte basically announced that he was going to do an anonymous jury for at least the first trial. And then I think also for the second one. So, and he did that even though neither side had asked for it. And I think right before the trial, the two sides may have objected to it. And he said, no, we're going to do it. And just for people that don't know, at least the the way the term's being used here, anon- in a truly anonymous jury that the parties wouldn't know who the jurors are by name at all. Um, I think in New York, they may not have used questionnaires, so they might just do it verbally, but I wasn't at that trial, so I'm not totally sure. So maybe you would end up through the voir dire process with some notion of who somebody is, that they work at the Library of Congress or something along those lines, but you wouldn't know their identity in a way that you could probably do any meaningful uh, research. Um, And I thought it was interesting that the prosecutors also didn't seem to want that level of anonymity. So clearly, both sides are concerned either about, uh, for lack of a better term, what you might call ringers that get onto the jury that have very, very strong pro or anti-Trump views, or they are seeking such people, um, you know, to be on the jury um, and, and have some dynamics around that uh, that they're trying to um, pursue. So that that was interesting. But as I said earlier, um, Anna, like one of Bratt's, Jay Bratt's main points down there in Florida was we don't know when the D.C. trial is going to happen. We don't know if the D.C. trial is going to happen. And, you know, he said he seemed to be foreshadowing this, um, how the immunity fight could play out. I think um, the motion was filed, I believe, last night. And so then he then did a filing at seven o'clock this morning, he being brat with Judge Cannon saying, look, not only are they, you know, asking for immunity, I think the immunity motion was already filed. I'm sorry, but they asked for a stay. And so now they're trying to actually halt the trial in DC. And they also want you to schedule the one in Florida around it. And it's, uh, they, he suggested that it was a uh, uh, she was done a dirty sort of by the Trump lawyers who didn't say, by the way, we're planning to file a motion for a stay tonight in the D.C. case, because obviously they didn't write it in five minutes. Um, but so so that's sort of the dynamic that's going on, the interplay between these two trials, like, you know, March 4th and May 20th. is like, you know, they're really not that far apart. There was discussion yesterday in Florida about, you know, how long would this trial take? Uh, you know, maybe they'll do jury selection in a week in D.C. Maybe it'll take three weeks. Like, I, you know, nobody really knows. Um, there's some SEPA material at issue in that case. What will happen around the SEPA stuff? Nobody really knows. What if the D.C. Circuit issues a stay or the Supreme Court issues some kind of uh, stay? I think Trump's argument that the immunity issue should preclude a trial um, if he has a valid argument in my view, is not a bad argument. It doesn't seem like it's much relief to him if he's really not supposed to be tried for anything related to things he did as president to come in two years from now and say, well, on full review with full merits hearing by the D.C. Circuit and the Supreme Court, we've decided there's a bit too much evidence of what he did as president. And so therefore, we're going to release him from jail or, you know, um, unmake him as president. I, I don't know what it, what the result would be. It does seem to put the the cart before the horse. So, so I, you know, like the, like the gag order, like the 14th amendment stuff, I I did a piece earlier this week that the Supreme court seems like it has um, a lot of stuff coming their way from Donald Trump. And it's not going to be the kind of trivial stuff that they were able to swat away over the last year or two. I don't mean to diminish it, but it's just, it's not stuff that's going to be easy to swat away. I mean, if, if he's stricken from a ballot, right, Ben, you know, they have to make a decision that effectively no, either that, put back on the that ballot. That one they absolutely have to hear. I, right. I think they could, they could not hear certainly a stay motion with respect to presidential immunity. I don't see how they avoid the presidential immunity question itself. Um, they could hear that on a very expedited basis. Uh, as an initial matter, it's. I, I agree with you. It is clearly subject to 
to interlocutory appeal. She's going to rule. She wouldn't be doing all this trials prep stuff if she were going to grant this or grant a, a stay. So I think we can take for granted that she will deny it. Um, and then you have two questions as an initial matter. One is, uh, how quickly does the D.C. Circuit hear it? Uh, and the second question is, do they issue a stay while they do it, or do they uh, let everything continue while they're thinking about it? Um, and then you repeat and rinse and repeat those same two questions at the Supreme Court level, assuming that the D.C. Circuit uh, rules for the government. Um, uh, but I don't see how... Um, I mean, Trump has two chances on, on this motion. One is simply a chance to, to win. He's got to win that at the Supreme Court level. You can't win it at the lower court level, but, he's, but he can win it. I mean, he, that's, but, the, but the other possibility that, he's, that I think is very real is that he could use it to eat up real time. Um, and, you know, if the Supreme Court decides to be slow with this and to issue a stay, that's the end of the March here, the March thing, right? So if they decide to do that. So maybe that explains Jay Bratt's urgency in trying to keep the Florida case on track because exactly. he realizes there's really a non-zero risk. Maybe the loss is another question, but of that case being derailed for a few months, in which case, at least from the point of view of the special counsel's office, the Florida classified documents case becomes the only game in town for them. I think, well, I think that's right. I, you know, Yitzhak Rabin used to say, we will pursue the peace process as though there were no terrorism and we will pursue the terrorists as though there were no peace process. And this is very similar. You know, we're going to pursue the South Florida case as though there were no January 6th insurrection case and you're going to pursue the January 6th insurrection case as though there were no South Florida case. And if you are so lucky that they both come to fruition at exactly the same moment, then you say to one of the judges, hey, can, can we put it off for eight weeks? Uh, we, we, we want a gold mine. And that's embarrassing, but it's not the biggest problem. Right. But Trump, Trump's lawyer's point is it's not a trial. It's not a single discrete event that will take place in three to six months. It's everything that leads up to that. And to sort of pretend like all these dates and deadlines aren't interwoven, you know, they keep pointing out the special counsel's office basically asked for a trial on the same day that there's hearings scheduled in the Florida case. And, you know, the special counsel say, well, basically Trump should hire more lawyers or what have you. And he says, well, I have, you know, his side says, you know, he has a right to counsel of his choice. And, you know, we had an illustration at yesterday's hearing in Florida that, you know, Chris Keis is defending Trump's business empire from basically being shut down up in New York. And he phoned into the hearing because he's literally on lunch break from that trial arguing this trial. So there is a practical reality at a certain point that it is going to be difficult to keep these, you know, trains completely independent. And and the judge basically said, in her view, it's a little bit unrealistic um, to think that no, that's, that's going to be possible. I think that's right. And, you know, if Judge Cannon and Judge Chutkin were in touch with one another, which they could be either by picking up the phone and having a conversation or by reading each other's orders, there's an obvious solution to this problem, which is Judge Cannon should chill for a few weeks and see if the D.C. Circuit issues a stay um, or not, because Without a stay, there's going to be a sort of full steam ahead to, to a March trial. With a stay, Judge Cannon can schedule this whenever she wants. And so I, I think there's actually a way to square the circle, but you can't do it now. Right. And she doesn't have to issue a new trial date right away. She could suspend the current trial date without saying when it's suspended until, or she could just leave it in place and say, we'll revisit um, a set a hearing in the beginning of December or middle of December and we'll revisit the trial date issue or in January and we'll revisit the trial date issue. And that would avoid the certain political and quasi-political blowback that I alluded to earlier, that if she punts this trial to November 15th, you know, uh, I can tell you from the commenters on my 
Twitter account, um, there will be certain people that are just convinced the fix is in and she's just simply trying to get Trump off the hook. So so that would save her that uh, that pain, at least for some say, you know, it would leave open the possibility, like you're saying, that, you know, she, she may find a different solution to this problem in eight weeks or 10 weeks that that is not available to her right now. All right. Let's talk about Fulton County before we go to audience questions. Uh, if you are in the audience and you have a question, of course, uh, leave a question in the Q&A so I can flag it, uh, flag it for me. Uh, uh, and of course, say whether you want me to read it or whether you want to read it yourself. If you are watching on YouTube, you should be on the Zoom. You can do that by becoming a material supporter of Lawfare. Go to lawfaremedia.org slash support. Join the elect few, the uh, 80 people who are currently in the Zoom with us and who get to have their questions answered. You too can come into the light. Anna Bauer, we had a frenzy of activity in Fulton County. We were like, every day there was a new plea. We were going to trial. It was all very exciting. We were doing jury selection and then poof, it's all gone. And nobody's talking about Fulton County anymore. <laughs> Uh, do you feel lonely? I do feel pretty lonely. I feel like I am not getting enough attention anymore. You know, um, no, I, I, there's been so much going on in these other cases. So, uh, I, but I do think that there's, uh, less attention on Fulton County right now. Um, so just for a very quick update, because especially because the Anna of Green Gables garden is getting very cold, um, and I'm freezing. Um, so I'm going to run through a few things just very briefly tomorrow. There is a hearing uh, before Judge McAfee. Uh, it is a hearing on Harrison Floyd's uh, subpoenas that he's issued uh, trying to get a, a access to elections data and, and uh, information from the Secretary of State's office and from the Fulton County uh, uh, Board of Elections. They basically are trying to get a lot of the same information that uh, they, you know, wanted to get back in 2020 when they were looking for evidence of fraud. Um, and the Secretary of State's office has said, you know, this is too broad. We, uh, they've uh, sought to quash those subpoenas. Uh, the Fulton County Board of Elections has sought to quash the subpoena as well. Um, and then Harrison Floyd has responded by saying that he needs this information because he intends to relitigate the issue of whether the 2020 election was stolen uh, as his defense. So um, he uh, has, you know, filed this lengthy reply in which he's, you know, setting out all of these reasons why he needs access to this information. Um, and the hearing tomorrow is is uh, is where Judge McAfee will hear argument from the parties and decide whether he should quash the subpoenas um, to get access to the elections information. Um, I also, Ben, do have a report card for you on uh, young McAfee, as you call him. Yeah. Um, he gets an A plus this week because uh, uh, Judge McAfee, if, if folks recall, during these plea hearings uh, that he that he held for Scott Hall and Sidney Powell and Jenna Ellis and Ken Chesbro, um, under the uh, kind of typical uh, request that you can make under the First Defender Act is to have the the case docket sealed. Um, and uh, so he had ordered uh, those cases sealed, meaning that, you know, the members of the public no longer would have access to them, want to be able to see any kind of new updates or, or even the historical um, uh, files in the case. Um, he sealed those. And then this week we got an order from Judge McAfee in which he revisited his prior decision. He said that he, you know, thought about it further. Uh, realized that he didn't uh, uh, adequately weigh the public interest in the case um, and decided ultimately that the, those cases should not be sealed. And so he unsealed the cases um, and, and, and they are now, you know, the, the dockets are publicly available again. So uh, Judge McAfee continues to impress Ben. Uh, I, got, and I, mean, I gotta say, I think he is the most impressive 
person sitting on these cases. Uh, I mean, j like all jokes aside, when you get appointed to be a Fulton County Superior Court judge, the last thing you are expecting is it's not like, you know, being a district court judge in the District of Columbia where you've had a gazillion January 6 cases and you've always been aware that Donald Trump might be elected. This guy is barely out of law school. He's, you know, 12 years old or something. And he's, uh, you know, been a prosecutor for a little while, gets pointed to the court, and then bang in his courtroom is a 19 defendant RICO case, including the former president, the a bunch of the former president's lawyers, and he is just handling it like a professional. It is actually a thing of beauty to see, and I, you know, we make fun of judges when they when they act like you know, jerks and when they are pompous and when they uh, are flamboyantly wrong. This guy, I just urge you to watch his YouTube feed. It's all on YouTube because um, Georgia criminal procedure. And you just, he's sure-footed. He's respectful of both sides. He uh, takes argument. Uh, and then he just rules. And it's, it's, it's just, uh, it's, a very important, impressive, like no nonsense, just doing the work of getting 19 people to trial. And there was a, actually a very moving moment when Ken Chesbro's uh, lawyers uh, pled him out and um, and thanked the judge for tolerating their antics over the last several weeks. And, you know, jokes, you know, Jokes aside, they had done a real stunt, which was to try to invoke his uh, invoke his speedy trial rights and force this thing to trial in a in a really fast time frame, and then plead it out all of a sudden. Uh, and so th I think they were afraid that the judge was going to be annoyed, and they preemptively kind of apologized for it. And he uh, and Chesbro personally thanked him in a way that I thought was uh, you know spoke well of Chesbro. Um, and he just said, no, no, getting everybody uh, a fair trial and a fair hearing and due process, that's my job. And I just, I, I, you know, I've been joking about it for a few weeks with Anna, but I actually think this this guy is is a very, very, very fine trial judge. All right, let's do audience questions. Uh, Shannon, the floor is yours. But you gotta unmute yourself. Whenever I call your name, you you gotta unmute yourself. Ooh, Shannon's having trouble unmuting herself. Murray Lee, the floor is yours. Hello. Um, so the US has a very long election season um compared to other other places. Um, is there any, I guess, foundational theoretical reason for this, or is this just the US was big and it was the 18th century and news and people take, take time to travel. So you need to give people time to campaign and no one's ever revisited the thing. Like if someone turned up and said, excuse me, um, there will be a 10 week or whatever limited campaigning season and outside of that campaigning is, is severely restricted. Like other than traditional political dysfunction, would there be any, any blocker to that? Legally. Yeah, so this is a little bit of field of, of the current uh, subject, but let me give you a brief answer to it. No, it's not for historical reasons. It's actually the campaign, the length of the campaign season has grown and grown and grown uh, over recent decades. Um, and it's really a function of having 50 different state primaries is really where, where it comes from. Uh, it's Yes, it's a function of size, but more it's a function, I think, of federalism and the fact that unlike uh, European countries, uh, the First Amendment really restricts the ability to say you can't campaign outside of the season um, because the First Amendment says you can do pretty much whatever you want in the way of speech and political speech. And so the result is that everybody always has a little bit of incentive to start earlier than the last person did last time. And the season has a way of just growing and growing and growing. 
but uh, it's not a creature of an earlier uh, uh, century. It's very much a creature of the second half of the 20th century. Right. So a brief follow up, if I may, then what is the definition that, say, the Justice Department uses for like, when does campaign seasoning start? Because if, if you have like, if the executive says, we will not take these actions during a political campaign, to yeah, avoid so they, they do not what, say you know, we will not right. take these actions during a political campaign. What they say is, and it's it's a it's a sort of a traditionally unwritten normative policy, um, uh, and it, the traditional formulation of it is that with respect to candidates who are on the ballot, um, they do not take overt steps in criminal investigations like indictments or search warrants or the issuance of subpoenas to, uh, with respect to named ballot named candidates. Um, so it's a quite limited um, policy uh, and it's for 60 days prior to uh, the election. Um, so that's the, it, it's quite a limited policy and it is not within the campaign season because uh, that would mean you never indicted anybody. All right, uh, Shannon, are you, uh, are, 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 can you speak yet? I don't think she had a question. I did not ask a question in just to let you know. Ah, okay. Um, all right. Josh asks, uh, so the other questions are all uh, people who uh, uh, want me to read them. So um, uh, Josh asks, uh, to me, the reporting about Mark Meadows' cooperation is confusing. What do we know? Was he just given immunity and required to testify before a grand jury? So let me say uh, to this question, the answer to this question is we do not quite know precisely. Um, and uh, uh, please, uh, if uh, Josh, uh, Roger, Anna, if any of you have uh, theories about what we know and what it means, uh, feel free to share them. I, I can give mine as well. Josh, do you have thoughts on it? Yeah, I mean, my understanding is that that he was required to testify by the federal uh, prosecutors or to appear in front of the grand jury. Um, I have not seen or heard anything really to suggest beyond that, that he engaged in some kind of robust cooperation. That said, it was reported, and I think in the ABC report that brought this out, if I remember correctly, that he also went to sort of two pre-testimony sessions with prosecutors, you know, as a strictly legal matter, you're not required to do that. that. That came up when the same situation arose with Steve Bannon in the, um, in the, the uh, Roger Stone case, I believe where, uh, you know, he uh, wanted to make a show of the fact that he was being forced. He'd been subpoenaed, you know, he had to come in because he had said, been subpoenaed and that's why he was there. So he wasn't cooperating. He was just not going to go to jail, you know, over it. Um, and then the cross-examination was something about, well, but you went to these proffer sessions or you appeared a couple of times in the U.S. Attorney's Office to talk about this. What, who, what was requiring you to do that? And the answer was, well, I wasn't being forced to. So I, I think it's a similar kind of situation. Um, obviously, his lawyers would want to know what he's going to be asked about before they go into the grand jury and the lawyers, I shouldn't have used the plural, before he goes into the grand jury, the lawyers don't go in. So it may be more efficient for everyone to have a, a dry run, especially if there's some areas where they think he has some issue he didn't want to didn't want to talk about. So that's my understanding of what's happened. Um, I don't, I can't really tell you that it's firmly nailed down or I can point you to any specific documents or whatever um, that, that would, um, that can confirm uh, confirm that in great in great uh, detail. I don't know if Anna or Roger have any thoughts to the contrary or not to the contrary. Certainly not to the contrary. Uh, the only I think all of us assume, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that the, 
this was probably use immunity, meaning uh, that uh, technically he it means they can't use what he says against him. Uh, theoretically, they could still prosecute him using other evidence. As a practical matter, though, it makes it really, really hard for the prosecutors to prosecute him because you need to separate out not just what he said, but sort of the fruits of what he said. Um, on the other hand, at least it would not affect uh, Georgia's opportunity to uh, prosecute him, um, assuming there's no, uh, you know, because they have no access to uh, what the uh, what the federal prosecutors learned. Yeah, I will just add to that that there are really only two scenarios here that make any sense. Uh, one is that they made a judgment that they didn't have a case against Mark Meadows. Uh, that would explain why he's not named as an unindicted conspirator in the indictment. And it would also explain why they looked at the uh, looked at it and said, we're not going to give anything up if we immunize him. Uh, we don't have a case anyway. So let's, you know, he's going to assert the fifth if we bring him in. Uh, let's, you know, nuke that by giving him use immunity, uh, getting an order um, and, you know, take it from there and we're not losing anything. Uh, the other possibility is that they have an understanding with his lawyers that he's going to plead out to something and they're kind of they kind of haven't done that yet for the same reason that they haven't indicted the unindicted co-conspirators uh, and that there's a, one of the reasons he's been so quiet is, you know, uh, and so they've, they've basically worked stuff out or there's an understanding as to, you know, some kind of a plea that hasn't materialized yet. Uh, I think the first scenario is significantly more likely than the second scenario. I don't think there's any... Um, uh, I don't think there's a third scenario that makes sense, at least not to me. All right. Um, uh, Nathan asks, I didn't know if you have discussed this before, but what does everyone think about a constitutional amendment, however far into the future, uh, or it may be necessarily extending, if not clarifying, Article 1, Section 3, Clause 7 in particular, that any president, vice president, and or civil officer of the United States impeached by the House and convicted or removed from office by the Senate or the new text convicted subsequent to, uh, to service in office uh, in a court of law of treason, bribery, etc., cetera, uh, is no longer eligible to be president, et cetera. Uh, I will just handle this one myself. I think uh, the idea of um, uh, a constitutional amendment to the impeachment clauses uh, and the uh, eligibility clauses is so un, uh, improbable as to be worth only a very limited amount of time and consideration. Uh, and personally, I don't favor opening up the Constitution without a really, really good reason to do it. The big problem, by the way, with the impeachment clauses is that the bar for conviction is too high to be useful under the current uh, uh, landscape of radical partisanship. Uh, Jeff asks, uh, opinions about an inexperienced judge setting circuit court precedent on SIPA. Huh, I wonder what that could be a reference to. Uh, Roger, uh, Josh, do either of you uh, have a sense of, uh, of uh, ha have feelings about, uh, you know, usually we don't distinguish between ex inexperienced judges and other judges for purposes of how precedential their opinions are. And her, if her opinion isn't binding on anybody, do, do we have a problem with Judge Cannon ruling on SIPA matters? I think you're, you're muted. muted, Roger. Uh, I should be clear that although she's in the 11th Circuit, it's not binding on the 11th Circuit. It, it, she's a district court judge still. Um, still, it, it, it's a it's a ruling that's out there now and and uh, has some currency. And, um, you know, 
I, the fact that I don't, I've never seen someone sort of do legal research and put in parentheses, recent judge, you know, uh, I don't think, uh, uh, you get to, uh, undermine somebody, uh, that way. I, I think that, um, you know, almost all judges are very inexperienced with SEPA. I mean, with the exception of, you know, a handful of judges in the Eastern District of Virginia, which, you know, tends to handle a lot of the espionage type cases, as well as certain leak type matters. Um, most judges just don't encounter it a lot. I mean, I, I don't know. I could go through the building of the judges in the DC courthouse and uh, how many, you know, and that's funny because that's where the FISA court is that handles all this secret stuff. And there's like combo locks on some of the doors and, you know, hand scanners and stuff. And I don't know what they do behind those doors, but, but I just, you know, the judges just don't get a lot of cases that require SEPA. And I, I don't know what the numbers are, but I'd be surprised if the average judge gets more than one or two in their career. And it, it may be a fraction of one. So, you know, uh, and, and, and even when they do get SEPA cases, they very seldom get large volume SEPA cases, which is a different like it's an individual item that's classified. This is 31 documents and plus boxes and boxes full of documents for discovery purposes. It's a very big SEPA caseload. Only spies and like Snowden or Assange like cases generate this kind of SEPA volume. And, and you have all the underlying stuff. I mean, maybe that's what you mean by the boxes. I mean, you know, yeah. every one of these documents, the prosecutors have to go back to the intelligence community and say, you know, it's not good enough that it's stamped classified. It really needed to be classified. Did it need to be classified? Who had access to it? Was there ever any talk of declassifying it? If it was, why wasn't it declassified? They have to run all the traps on that stuff. I, I hope I hope they have. Uh, uh, the defense will certainly figure it out if they haven't. And so that all becomes part of it. And that's how you get, you know, thousands. You end up with thousands of pages the way the prosecutors are looking at it, the way the defense is looking at it. You could be looking at tens of thousands or 100,000 pages that they believe they're entitled to on every one of these, you know, classified programs that was mentioned once in, in any of these documents. Roger? Yeah, I, I will say that even though people don't say, well, she's recently appointed, uh, it is true, like Josh says, that in this field, I think judges know that a district judge in the Eastern District of Virginia is sort of worth more than a district judge in Tennessee. And um, uh, and also it happens that, you know, Judge Cannon has sort of her, her reputation at this point precedes her and, and so you know that there's that as well yeah and that works the other direction too you know we uh there are certain judges in the dc circuit district judges most famously i think among them was 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 judge thomas hogan who was just you know a deeply deeply respected district judge and i think the dc circuit read Tom Hogan opinions differently than they read other judges' opinions. There was just a respect for the factual work and the, uh, you know, and so judge opinions go up to higher courts with uh, presumptions associated with the names attached to them. Chris asks, um, I was wondering if the panel could address a couple basic items I haven't heard addressed directly. How is it that Judge Cannon isn't required to recuse, considering that she was nominated by the defendant? Also, would Fulton County prosecutors have offered deals this generous if these defendants didn't have federal exposure? Thanks for taking the questions. Um, so I'm going to ask Anna to address the second one of those. I will just say on the first one, the rules of recusal uh, as a general matter do not uh, include who appointed you. So there's a, this is, goes back a long way. This is not the first time a judge has had a case. Uh, first of all, the judge has had a criminal case, but criminal cases against former presidents don't haven't arisen all that much. 
judges have heard cases by in by the presidents in which they have been appointed either in their formal capacities or the, or their uh, individual capacities many times it, that is not considered a basis for recusal. Uh, Anna. Um, short answer, yes. I think that even if there's no federal expo exposure, I think that we still would see generous deals uh, from the Fulton County Prosecutor's Office. As far as I'm aware, all the deals that have been extended have been quite generous. And some of those folks don't, as far as we know, have uh, currently uh, a risk of, or at least a significant risk of federal exposure. Um, Jenna Ellis is not an un unindicted co-conspirator in the January 6th case. Uh, neither is Scott Hall. Um, and both of their deals were quite generous. That doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have of risk of criminal exposure at the federal level, maybe later down the road. I don't know. Um, but uh, that is just to say that I, I think that there's just a lot of other factors that go into uh, why uh, these deals are generous. I think Ben and I have talked before on a podcast we did last week about how I think that, you know, part of the strategy here, which Fonnie Willis has done in the past is just you kind of have this sprawling uh, group of people who are indicted, and then you're using these deals to kind of, uh, you know, uh, get people to uh, maybe what is what people are prone to calling flipping, although sometimes it's a little bit more complicated than that. But um, it, this is just her strategy. And, and also, I think the other thing to keep in mind, too, is that you know, in state court, the way that debt plea deals work, they typically are more generous. I mean, it depends situationally, but it's not like the, the federal uh, system where even if you take a plea, it, you very often are still serving time. Um, you know, in this in the state court system, uh, things just work a little bit uh, different. And, and so I think that um, even though these are very generous deals, yes, um, it just is not unusual when you look at Fonnie Willis's past practice. Um, uh, so I, I just think that it doesn't have to do necessarily with the federal exposure elements. Um, although I do think that that has been a complicating factor in getting people to enter plea deals. Um, so yes, that's all that I'm going to say. All right, uh, we got two more questions. We're gonna get through them. Steve asks, with respect to possible review by the Supreme Court of an adverse decision to Trump on section three, might they decline to rule on the theory that the case is not ripe until Trump is elected and about to be sworn? Uh, Roger, I'll see if you agree with me about this. It seems to me there's no chance of that because an adverse ruling to Trump would keep him off the ballot, which would uh, presumably violate his First Amendment rights if he's otherwise entitled to be on the ballot. It would also deprive the Republican Party of its nominee. Uh, so if he's not disqualified, it creates a very substantial, expressive, and ability to run for office problem for the candidate that I think would require Supreme Court review. Do you agree with that, Roger? Yes, I agree. All right, last question from Clarissa. I noticed a typo in Florida special counsel paper letting Judge Cannon that no Trump uh, asked for a delay in DC. Uh, Brad forgot to add the word not to the last line. Can they correct the last sentence? This court should not allow itself to be manipulated in this fashion. Uh, does anybody uh, have any information about this and uh, specifically about uh, how you fix typos in court filings? Well, I doubt they'll bother here because it's not uh, uh, there. You know, they do issue uh, errata in certain cases. And actually, I've begun writing to uh, courts and or actually to prosecutors to tell them when they uh, make er errors and have gotten some results. Uh, uh, the uh, 
the D.C. Circuit in a, a recent uh, ruling, uh, the Robertson ruling, um, mistakenly uh, thought that uh, uh, impeding a uh, officer during a uh, uh, civil disorder was a misdemeanor. No, it's a five-year felony, and it's actually sort of important to the to the ruling. So we'll see if they correct that one. But it, it happens, and they they, they issue errata. We are going to leave it there. Uh, Roger Parloff, Anna Bauer, Josh Gerstein, Heyman Hahn, you are all great Americans. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Josh, come back and join us sometime. Next time, I will expect a draft Supreme Court opinion uh, as the cost of, of, of uh, like your ticket for entry. Hey, uh, great Americans in the audience, uh, Remember, if you're joining from YouTube, you should be joining from the inner circle where we got this lovely chat going. We uh, swap stuff. It's great. It's like, you know, the inner sanctum. There's a secret handshake. Become a material supporter of Lawfare. Lawfaremedia.org slash support. You know you want to do it. You still have the chance. Hey, uh, that's it for us this week. We will be